very much indeed for coming along Thursday evening at seven o'clock. It's hardly the most riveting thing to, to spend your time at, but I guarantee you, you will uh, certainly learn some information tonight that should stick with you. We have a couple of videos, which always makes it more interesting, a couple of disaster movies, and I'm hoping that that will help uh, get through the process. As we said earlier on, the changes from BS 476 part 24 to EN 12101-7 and 15871. So it's very topical at the moment. And um, just as an introduction, so we know we're working with a company called Lindab. So Thorduct is part of the Lindab organization and it was established in 1959, over 4,000 employees, um, 120 branches in 32 countries. So a very significant player in the ventilation market. And we're very, uh, we're delighted that you've invited us along this evening. So what are we gonna talk about tonight? Well, the content of the discussion is as follows. We're going to talk about the EN standards. So I want to leave you at the end of it with a fairly good understanding of the differences in the standards. I want you to understand the importance of temperature control, hence the use of insulation, something historically that we didn't use an awful lot of when it came to ducts, but really has become very important. What I want to leave with you on that part is answer to the question, why are we insulating it? And do we need to insulate it? So once we understand the risks, it makes the decision very simple. We also need to talk about certification and competency because that's important both for the provider of the product and the CE marketing and of course the installer. So there's a competency requirement there. What is it? Is it EN? Is it BS? How do you guys decide or determine what it should be? So that's a, that's a hot topic as well. So we need to have some sort of guidance on that and we will give that to you tonight. And then there's just a couple of final recurring questions, a couple of little things that keep popping up. And so it's nice to share this back with you so that you know what you're looking at before these things arise on projects. So starting off, the EN standards. So the EN standards, there is a CPD handout. So don't worry, don't need to take the notes, but they're all here available for you. And you'll find them in our technical training and skills development CPD summary notes. In that note, we, uh, we talk about the various differences between the various products and the standards. The basic difference between BS and EN is this. There is mechanical pressure in an uh, EN test at a different level to what's in BS. And particularly with uh, smoke, the smoke is measured at 500 PA for A tests. And then based on that, you can do EN 1366A tests. So mechanical pressure, is applied to the tests in a way that isn't in the BS, simply to mimic what really happens in real life. Leakage is measured. Under BS, they didn't measure leakage. Under EN, you, to, be, to maintain your integrity, you have to have less than 15 meters cubed per meter square per hour. To be a fire resisting duct, it has to be less than 10 for class S. And for smoke, it has to be less than five meters cubed per meter square per hour during the test. So while the test is running, these are the measurements that must be maintained. So integrity is 15, smoke for, for uh, fire resisting ducts is class S, in other words, is less than 10. And for smoke duct, specifically smoke ducts, it has to be less than five. The other thing that's important to understand, this test is more onerous in that the cross-sectional area that must be maintained is higher. So under BS 476, if I gave you a duct that was a thousand by, by a thousand, under BS, you need to maintain 75% cross-section area. So you're basically looking at 750 by 750. So you're trying to maintain 75% of the cross-section area. Under EN, you must maintain 90%. So it has to be 900 by 900 during the test. And of course, this is very tricky because obviously you no know, metal will move with the temperatures that are involved. The orientation under BS 476 tests, you could test horizontal ducts and based on your horizontal duct tests, a lot of assessments could be made. Under EN, the assessment route is kind of closed off. You need to do physical tests. So you got to do horizontal, you got to do vertical, you got to do fire inside, fire outside, and of course the leakage test. So it's, there's a lot more involved in trying to get a classification. The fire curve is also important. And this is the one that manufacturers don't really like. The fire curve is a higher fire curve. It's a hydrocarbon fire curve. But the significance of note is that the red curve that you see there on the screen, it kind of gets up to pretty much the same temperatures as BS476. The only difference is it gets there a lot quicker. So the opportunity for the ductwork to settle down in a fire scenario or in a test scenario 
is not there. So the lobster effect under BS is no longer there because under EN, the duck gets an immediate shock in terms of temperatures. So that has impacts, uh, very significant impacts in terms of performance of the duct, but the cross-sectional area and the leakage are the big, big changes. And ultimately, from a smoke control point of view, that makes sense. We don't want leaky duct, we want it to perform. And also from an energy point of view, we want it to perform, but the cross-sectional area, making sure that the cross-sectional area stays open to the levels that we need, means that we sometimes can deduct, we can make the duct a little bit smaller. So again, all energy, but also factually working in a fire. And of course the furnace is uh, the worst kind of fire for testing any product, okay? Um, rolling forward, here's the good bit. We'll give you the science at the start and then you needn't worry about it afterwards. Again, all of this information is in our handouts. There are two standards that we need to be familiar with. BS476 was a single standard. Under the EN standards, which are issued by SEN, Center for European Norms, they took smoke control ducts and treated them differently from fire resisting ducts. So smoke control is removal of smoke. Fire resisting ducts are used for passive pressurization in kitchens. So they're the kind of applications. And this one is standard 12101-7. That is a harmonized standard. And it came into action in July, 2013. So since July, 2013, we are required to fulfill the requirement under this particular standard. And um, the one for fire resisting ducts, we adopted the standard April, 2015. We adopted the classification and the test standard 2015. You see this little word PR in front of EN 15871. That means it's not, an, not a harmonized standard at this point in time. However, the classification, the test standards and the extended field of application are all there and all approved. Smoke as a standard is an approved standard with an approved classification, with an approved test standard for multi-compartment and single. However, the extended field of application isn't. So it wouldn't be the Europeans if they didn't get a little bit of messing going on. Here we have the extended field isn't approved. Here we have the standard isn't approved and opposites on top and bottom. So what does that mean? Well, from a, from a smoke control point of view, smoke ducts need to be classified to EN 13501-4. And then they must be tested multi eight and single nine. Now, what, what the classification standard does, all classification standards do, is they make manufacturers honest. So if I test and I get great results in certain areas of my tests and not so good in others, I write a report that says I'm brilliant and my competitor will do the same and it's very confusing. So having a classification standard lays down the rules by which the results are reported so they're uniform. And the most important document from a specifier's point of view or somebody who has to determine, have you got the right product? Get your eyes on the classification standard. It doesn't lie. If somebody's not giving it to you, you need to ask a question, why aren't they giving it to you? So it's very important, get your hands on this. The classification standard covers the product, including the product, the access doors, the bracketry, and the installation. So anything that's in the product, it's all covered under the one classification report. That means you can't swap elements of it out. If you want to say that this is classified EI60 or EI90, EI120, it's only classified if you use all of the components in the manner it was constructed all together under the single or under the single or under the multi uh, compartment test. The extended field of application, what that does is allows us based on these test parameters to extrapolate information. So if we wanna make something, if we wanna make a uh, determination about insulation, all the rules are in here about the size of the duct, et cetera, et cetera. There is no extended field of application ready yet because the 13668 test is a leakage test. And in the process of leakage test, they put in a restrictor into the duct to measure the oxygen at two points. The problem is this is specifically measured for a specific duct for the test. To do bigger ducts, the problem is they haven't got their finger around to working out the mathematics. So that's not there. However, under the, under the fire resisting ducts, you do have the option to do the extended field for larger ducts. Important to know, both of these standards, the standard size is 1250 by 1000 max. So under that standard, maximum size is 1250 by 1000. Same with this classification standard as well. The good news is that under the, the extended field of application suitable for fire resisting ducts, we can produce and test up to two and a half meters by 1250 as a duct. You can't put it on the market unless you test it. 
and the test ability is there and there are people who have actually tested. So it is available. And the other thing is CE marking. So CE marking is part of uh, the section called ZA3. You have a ZA3 in every approved harmonized standard. And what it does is it lays out the rules by which CE marking must apply. So in this scenario under uh, 12.101-7, that ZA applies. However, under 15.871, because this is not a harmonized standard, it's not applicable. So you cannot CE marking for kitchen, pressurization or passive. You can have a classification report and some manufacturers will voluntarily provide a declaration of performance based on this. So not having the CE mark is just a by the by. Um, it is absolutely required for production product standard here for smoke, but it is not, it's not available. It is not possible to do it for passive pressurization in the kitchen. So that's the kind of heavy techie side of it out of the way. Um, the, there's another handout, Understanding the EN Regulations, and that little table appears inside that booklet. So please, by all means, make sure you download it. It's nice and easy to read and lots of color pictures and everything else. Okay, classifications uh, rules. Classification reports would be issued by what we call a notified body. So a notified body is somebody like Warrington Fire in the UK. There is an organization in SAM called the European Organization for Technical Approvals, EOTA. And Warrington would be a member there, like Atlas is in Spain, or uh, Effectus is in France. So these people are qualified and supervised to issue classification reports. They'll mention the standard, could be 13501-3 or 4, and they'll report everything in terms of E for integrity, I for insulation, the number of minutes the product is suitable for, and whether it's horizontal, vertical, inside to out, outside to in, and S for smoke leakage. So again, there's different different classifications depending on the construction and what's been expected of the product. So it's just important to know that. The smoke standard always is determined as EI. It's always EI for smoke control ducts, integrity and insulation. Passive pressurization in kitchen can be E only. However, the standard doesn't allow you to classify above E60. So it's just one of those little quirks in the, in the system. So what we did and what we would, uh, what I would ask you to look out for when you're looking at a classification, sometimes the manufacturer has a note from the, from the fire laboratory saying, saying that if E120 was a possible to classify that this product would or would not be suitable. So it's important for you to, to have a good handle on whether an uninsulated duct can exceed E60, all right? Um, the fire types, just in case people aren't familiar with this, there are two fire types, fire type A, fire type B. And fire type A, the duct is a sealed duct. It's inside the furnace, the furnace is burning, and there's measuring going on outside the duct. There's pressure 500 PA or 300 PA pulling through the duct. And what's happening here is making sure the fire doesn't break in. So this is very, very important. That's a type A, we call it fire all around. Okay, so that's outside to inside typical for a kitchen, and I'll explain that later. And then we have type B, which is effectively the furnace is on fire, and there's a lovely big hole in the duct, and we're sucking it through at three meters per second. So we're pulling the fire and the hot gases through the furnace, through the duct, and measuring the performance of the duct on the outside. So that's type A, and that's type B, okay? Um, just by the way, all ducts, and I, I really need to go back one there, all ducts when they're tested are tested on their own. So you have one duct in a, in a wall, and when you're testing it, you don't have other services there. That's not reality. That's not what happens in real life. So very often we have multiple OPS where we have a fire damper or a smoke damper, we have fire duct, we have cable tray, we have uh, all sorts of services, pipes going through a single OP. That's very common. There is no test um, specific to ducting to measure this kind of a scenario. And something like this is always going to be ad hoc. It's really difficult for you guys out in the field where you're meeting a whole pile of services to be sure that every element is playing its part. So what we did was, as part of a uh, multi-services test to the standard 1366-3, which is your uh, penetration test, we submitted our product together with another number of services, 17 services in a single loop, to see how our duct performed and how, was it suitable for use in multiple scenarios? And we were, we were good, good to go. We got 120 minutes and we did this test 
for London Underground. So again, very happy to do that. Just gives you comfort. Of course, every scenario is not exactly the same, but it can give you some comfort to know that this product can be incorporated with other services in a multi-services shaft or um, up where you're sealing it off. And again, all depends on what kind of penetration you use, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I need to show you something and there's gonna be a little video here, which is always good. And what I want to show you is there is this idea in, in floating around, which we need to put to bed. And what it is, is it's the idea that if you wrap a product with fire resisting insulation, that effectively you've, you've mitigated the fire risk. The problem with this, and it's, it's, it's very common in the United States and Australia particularly, they take ordinary ducts and they wrap them with insulation. The idea is that, well, we've got a fire duct. The truth of it is that whatever you connect insulation to, it depends on the integrity of what it's connected to. So if it's connected to duct, the duct has to stay in place. If the duct moves, then the insulation is going to fall off. And I just want to show you this actually happening. So I'll just pause it there so you can see. You can see that the fans are connected here to draw out the air through the duct. This is a type B test. And what's happening here is the duct is glowing orange because we're up to nearly 900,000 uh, degrees C. The duct has brackets at these points. However, you can see what's happened. The duct has become like a snake. So it's falling over the brackets. And that's what happens to metal whenever uh, those kind of temperatures are applied to it. Metals lose their strength. So naturally this is going to open up and the result is the insulation will come away. The components will break down. You'll have a fire breaking out somewhere else. And that is a plasterwood wall. The furnace is on the other side. So the fire is on the other side, but this is overhead. So this is clearly a clear demonstration that insulation on a duct is not in and of itself the solution to a problem. So it's just important to share that with people because I've encountered it from time to time. And it's just important to understand whatever you connect insulation to, whatever material, the material's integrity is going to determine the performance of the insulation. All right, uh, temperature control and use of insulation. So the first part that I've given you is the heavy stuff. It gets a little easier from here on in. So basically temperature control and how do we manage that is insulation. In a fire scenario, we have high levels of smoke. Where you do not have a smoke extract system, the net effect of that is that because of the presence of smoke, you have higher temperatures within the environment of the fire. So the temperature itself of the fire will increase and everywhere around it will increase. Where you have a smoke evacuation system, the temperatures are lower. Now, the flash temperature of the fire, the fire itself in terms of the flame temperature, sorry, the flame temperature is not different. However, the temperature within the environment of the fire is significantly different. And that, that removing this smoke is very important. It helps evacuation. It makes sure that we've got plenty of visibility, gets rid of the toxicity, and it's also taken the thermal energy out of the area of the fire. So it's very important to have what we call a smoke evacuation system that we can rely on. So all of these things are taken into account with the new EN tests to reflect what we need to do here. There is a risk associated with this. Now, if we have a single compartment where we have a fire and a duct going straight to the atmosphere, not crossing another fire compartment, no problem. We're just taking the smoke out. However, where that duct crosses another fire compartment on its way to atmosphere, whether it's one or 21, it doesn't matter. The issue is, think about it, we're taking these high temperatures through an area where there is no fire. So what is the risk associated with that? So I'm going to keep quiet for a little moment and I'm going to let this gentleman do a little bit of talking first and hopefully everybody can hear this loud and clear. several different definitions of flashovers. The one that makes the most sense to me, it's the stage in fire development in which the contents and the gases reach their ignition temperatures and flames break out almost all at once over all the surfaces. 
there are a few different types of flashovers that exist. The NFPA now calls all the different types of flashover rapid fire progress. Those different types, the most common is a hot, rich flashover. That's the, the most common that firefighters run into on the fire ground. The cause of a flashover or a hot, rich flashover is what I'm referring to is a term called thermal radiation feedback. Everything in nature tries to find a balance. If I grab a can of Coke, that Coke's going to warm up and my hand in turn is going to cool off. Um, same thing's happening inside of a structure. The seed of the fire is growing. The energy and heat that's being created is being absorbed into the material of that room. It's trying to find that thermal balance. Once it can't find that balance or that balance is exceeded, the material starts to break down, starts to form a gas called carbon monoxide and radiate that heat back to the center of the room. That process is called pyrolysis. Once it reaches the center of the room, it's going to want to try to find a way to go back to the walls. But like a sponge, it can only absorb so much heat. So then that heat then begins to build and build and build until it reaches its ignition temperature and then it ignites into fire and you get flames breaking out not only through the gas, but every single surface in that room. It's all about heat and energy. You have to have heat to break down a solid to a gas. And that's what produces that very volatile gas. And that's what's killing and hurting us this day. Another type of rapid fire progress or RFP is backdraft. That's probably one of the most uncommon types that we encounter on a fire ground. I've only witnessed one in my 33 years of service. And what that is, it's a fire that's generated so much heat and used up all the oxygen in the room that it just sits and smolders and smolders. The heat does not go away. The air is gone, but that superheated gas has been confined and it's just perking and perking, waiting for us to either open a door or someone to open a door or let fresh air in. It mixes with all the gas that is in there. The heat is already there. And when it ignites, it ignites with an explosive force. The other would be a delayed flashover. A delayed flashover is also very dangerous for firefighters. Picture a house with a fire that began in a rear bedroom. The smoke and energy has traveled throughout the home, filling it with superheated gases. As firefighters enter the home, a hot, rich flashover occurs in the rear bedroom. The sudden increase in temperature is enough to ignite the gases throughout the entire home. Firefighters could be faced with gases igniting all around them, yet the seat of the fire is in another part of the structure. Okay, so insulation is critical now in terms of our management of smoke evacuation ducts and all smoke extract ducts, multi-compartment, EM13668 tested and EM13661 tested, are now tested with insulation. And they're tested with insulation to measure the performance of the insulation while they're removing hot gases from the scene of a fire out through an area where there is no fire. So the, measurement, the measuring devices measure the performance of the insulation. No one thermal uh, con connection can exceed 180 degrees, and, and the mean average of all the thermocouples cannot exceed 140 degrees. So we're measuring up to 1,000 degrees passing through these ducts <clears throat> to make sure that there's no risk of, of radiating the heat in a compartment where there is no fire and potentially causing a flashover event. So critically important, they're all tested now with insulation. So we insulate smoke extract to keep the heat in. That's the key thing because we don't want a flashover event. The other risk or the other area we're concerned about is kitchens. And in the kitchens, we're concerned about a particular risk and that is grease. So grease inside the ducts are a real issue for us. Um, the issue for us the solution, the obvious solution is regular cleaning of the kitchen extract duct. Now, the grease that we have in here originates from the cooking oils primarily. The oils that we, uh, our, our chippers use, our restaurants use, all have a flash temperature in excess of 350 degrees C. However, when you use oils over a period of time and you heat them up and cool them down, heat them up and cool them down, you do a thing called oxidization. And the process of oxidization ends up reducing the flash temperature of the grease down to 100 and 80 degrees. So at 180 degrees, there is the potential for this grease to ignite. So the, the solution is to regularly clean the kitchen extract up. However, there is no fire regulation or health and safety regulation that I'm aware of that says you must clean your kitchen extract. And even if you did, the result is within a week, there's the potential to have grease building up once again, depending on the, on the volume of use of the restaurant. So all kitchen extract ductwork that is multi-compartment 
must, uh, must be fire resistant duct and must also be insulated. So you're probably saying to yourself, my goodness, instead of talking about ducts here, we're talking about insulation. But I want to show you why. Let's look at a shopping centre. We all remember what they used to be. We used to go there years ago. I haven't seen one in a long time. But basically inside the middle of all our restaurants or all of our shopping centres, we have the restaurant area, usually in the centre for the purpose of footfall. We come along and we need to put in ventilation ducts or kitchen extract ducts. So we run ducts from the restaurant across the store, across an escape route, across the store straight outside. Not untypical. This one on the bottom right, we come to the wall. There's other services there. And unfortunately, we have to go down a bit further. This one on the left hand side kind of meanders across. Now, let's just remember five years after this place is opened, this guy who owns this store doesn't necessarily know what's above the suspended ceiling. So he won't know that there's any potential risk there. The principle behind all fire strategies is a thing called compartmentation. So if a fire starts in this compartment here, close the doors and the fire will stay in here for a period of time, the lowest common denominator of the building materials. So it's either the doors or the windows, whatever's got the lowest number, that's how long the fire will stay in here. We wanna keep it in for 30 or 60 minutes, get everybody out of the place, allow the fire brigade to fight it and contain the fire. Scenario, fire starts, little fire starts in this store, fire hits the suspended ceiling. The flame temperature is going to be in excess of 180 degrees, goes above the suspended ceiling. What's above the suspended ceiling? Kitchen extract. What's inside the kitchen extract? Grease. But we've nothing to worry about because everything is designed around compartmentation. However, when that flame touches that duct, the grease inside the duct will ignite and it will cascade and suddenly the fire breaks out here, 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 and across an escape route and back into the restaurant. So suddenly something that was so small and so minor has gone crazy. It's gone all over the place and gone out of control. Very dangerous for firefighters going in to fight a fire to discover there's a kitchen grease stuck somewhere in the vicinity because they could end up being trapped. So in order to prevent the risk of this happening, we have to, according to DW172, all multi-compartment kitchen extract must be insulated. So what I mean by multi is from the minute it leaves the kitchen all the way here until it gets to atmosphere, that needs to be insulated. Smoke, we insulate it to keep the heat in. Kitchen, we insulate to keep a fire out. That's what we're doing. So this is critically important. And this has been a regulation for 12 to 15 years. It's not been the practice but more recently in the last two or three years, everybody understands and we are insulating the duct. So critically important why we know we do that. There is a specific test for kitchens and the test is it built into EN 13661. It's called a combustible linings test. And what they do is it's a sealed duct, the fire's on the outside and they put measuring devices on the duct to measure the physical temperature of the duct inside the furnace and this duct is insulated and that's the true measurement of the performance of your kitchen extract. Okay, so it's very specific. I want to show you a little video, nothing beats an oil video. This guy was videoing at the time this fire started. It's in Singapore. All of a sudden the fire starts. You can see all the little people running and grabbing their food. They're more concerned about the food than the fire. But the fire starts down at the back of the, of the building. Now this is an open area building. So that even raises questions about open areas but there's a kitchen extract duct. I want you to see how many seconds it takes for the kitchen fire or for the fire to hit the kitchen or hit the kitchen duct and get all the way to the kitchen. Okay, so you saw the flash in there. That's 36 seconds. So it has moved all the way up to the restaurant uh, where they were cooking the food. So that whole length of duct is now fueling the fire because the grease inside it has ignited. And um, when you download the presentation or watch it later, just have a look after about three minutes or four minutes, the whole building's on fire. So grease ducts are a real, real problem and a real concern when it comes to managing fire. So insulating them is critically important. This is considered single compartment. 
So even in that scenario, there's a question over whether it should have been insulated or not. Not mine to answer, thank goodness, but multi-compartment kitchen extract needs to be insulated to prevent a fire somewhere else getting to the grease duct and causing the grease to cascade the fire. Okay. Um, one other area just to be aware of pressurization systems. They're a particular type of system. And in the ASFP Blue Book, it talks about the pressurization systems, multi-compartment are insulated. And what they do in the event of a fire is they put positive pressure into a protected area to allow if a door opens that smoke will not migrate into the protected area of the escape route. So they force themselves against the smoke. Now, when you're providing that duct, they need to be insulated as well because you do not want a fire in this compartment causing the duct to suit. And so you're pumping in hot air in excess of 100 degrees. I mean, whatever about everything else trying to get out of the building, the last thing you need is to have a sauna and to be burning people with the temperatures of the air. So they have to be insulated as well. So as you can see, insulation is prevalent and temperature control is uh, something we need to give a lot of consideration to. Okay, we're doing good, we're almost there. Certification and competency, okay? So certification and competency under the standard 12107 for smoke, the requirement in it about uh, ZA3 and CE marking references a thing called factory production control, FPC. So the manufacturer must establish an FPC system. And what that means is he has an audit conducted by an independent notified body. And so Warrington, for example, are a notified body who can do these kind of uh, factory production controls. So having the FPC in place allows you because they give you a certificate of constancy of performance to issue a CE marking on your product. Now, there is an argument that because product is very often insulated on site that it shouldn't be CE marked. It's a red herring because the reality is if a producer chooses not to CE mark, that's just a matter of a label, but there's no excuse for not having FPC in place. We need to give confidence to the market about the fact that when a product leaves a factory, somebody independent of the manufacturer is validating that the right materials, the right construction, the right delivery of the product, exactly as it was tested, is provided to the customer. So very important that a certificate of constancy performance is put in place, which allows for ECE marking. And whether you have the label or not, the FPC is in the spirit of the standard. And uh, Linda absolutely insists that all our manufacturers and licensees must maintain this. The other area of competency that we're always concerned about is you can have a lovely product leave in the factory and lo and behold, people install it who don't have the competency to do that. So in the UK, they have the CDM regulations. We have the BCAR and this slide needs to be updated. But basically, we have a BCAR regime. And so to give comfort, one of the things that we encourage um, people to do is to insist on the installer having some certification of his own. And installers of fire resisting ducts are encouraged to be members of a third party scheme, like, for example, Ferris. We recommend Ferris in Ireland simply because they have an office in Belfast and people on the ground. There are other offers, uh, other options. They just don't have people here. So what they will do is they will they will do an audit of the installer. Does he understand what he's doing? Does he know what passive fire is? Has he got the proper install manuals? They'll go and look at a job. They'll audit his records in the in the in the uh, in his office and then every quarter they will randomly visit one of his sites and validate it so at the end of a job you are given a certificate like this which is stronger than the installer which is written independently and it references the job so very important i would encourage people always insist on making sure that your installer has third-party accreditation okay now this is a topic that gets everybody excited and um, the second last one en or bs what am I supposed to pick? And it is difficult because I understand it, but when you're a novice to this, it can be a bit confusing. There is a document which we are glad to share with you and will be available to you. Technical guidance document number 20, issued by the ASFP, BESA and AGCAS. It has the date of August 2020. It was November before it came out. But basically they tried to address these concerns and this will be considered good practice. So under smoke control ducts, no question, it's EN 1250 by 1000 or 1000 diameter below those sizes, it must be to the EN standard. You cannot use BS 476 for these applications under any circumstances. Um, so that's, that's the maximum size that you're permitted to, to use, okay? So what happens 
when the duct is bigger? What if it's 1600 by four? What, what are we supposed to do? So the guidance that they have given is as follows. Um, they say a battery of ductwork systems may be considered. So what I mean by that is if the ductwork is uh, 1600 by four, you'd use two ducts 800 by four, both of them made to the EN standard and you'd independently support them. So you would use two ducts. So obviously you try and stay within the size 1250 by 1000. If you can't, you use a battery and it says thereafter above this size, uh, can be supplied as tested or assessed against BS 476 part 24 until the extent of field of application is available. So it is possible to provide BS 476. The first option should be to keep inside the size. Second is to do, use a battery or the third then is to use BS. A further option is to have an engineering judgment by a notified body where the ductwork is based on the EN construction and support size itself. So you take what's tested and proven and you say, I'm gonna make a bigger duct based on those construction uh, parameters. However, the engineering judgment must be by a notified body. A fire engineer is not, or fire engineering practice is not a notified body. Notified bodies are separate and apart. So somebody like Warrington certification in the UK. So EN 13668 standard, BS not allowed, greater than 1250 by 1000 split the ducts, BS with the approval of the fire consultant or EN by a notified body. That's the guidance that we will give you on that based on this form. When it comes to fire resisting ducts, the standard EN 15871 is not published. So it is not an official standard. This means um, this means ductwork up to two and a half meters by 1250 or 1250 diameter for fire resistant ducts would have to be tested and classified under the standard whenever this uh, is approved. BS 476 fire tested ducts that fall within the scope of the standard may be used with the fire system designer's approval until the product standard is published. So the fire system designer can call up BS 476 part 24. He can do that. However, and again, we just have to be careful of the wording here. However, since the fire test standards are all in place for the EN 1366 range, clients designers should request compliance with these. Effectively, what they're saying is it's available, it's best practice, and so you should go that route. They're not saying you have to, they're saying you should. So whoever the fire system designer is, he can, he can accept BS 476 part 24. However, this is available. So EN is a higher standard than BS 476. In the UK, under the CDN regulations, you must demonstrate why the selection of a lower performing duct is suitable for, for purpose. In Ireland, we don't ask you to do that, but certainly EN 1366 is available. And for the vast majority of jobs, EN 1366 is now being called up. However, your BS is still floating around. If you go outside the size two and a half meters by 1250, you can either split the ducts or go for BS 476 part 24. I'm sorry that's so confusing, but that's the reality and I'm trying to share it with you the best way I can. The XL range that is available has to be, if you want to produce a two and a half by 1250 duct, you must test it. Here's an example, a two hour duct that has been tested for integrity insulation, EI120, and this is an XL duct. So you can see how big that is. It's so big that one of the laboratories in, in Spain had to build a brand new furnace just to be able to handle that specific size. And when we were building it, people were standing inside and standing up. So that's how big this is. So again, we can do it uh, once it's tested and provided. So, however, if it is not all, um, they do say that um, a specific project engineering judgment by a notified body can be carried out if you want to go for a bigger sizes. So again, that's never going to happen because you're never going to get their attention, but it is available two and a half by 1250, okay? We'll probably have a few questions on this, I know, near the end. Final recurring thing, thank you very much for your time. Now, these things, first of all, don't work passing through a protected route. Be careful of this, because this keeps coming up, guys. Um, you end up with a scenario where you can't use fire dampers for whatever reason. So you have a duct crossing a protected route. The protected route under BS 99 2017, it says fire resisting ductwork classified, E for integrity, I for insulation. S for smoke leakage and X is the number of minutes in accordance with BS EN 13501-3. So BS 99 is calling up EN for these ducts. And these are not smoke ducts because smoke ducts are 13501-4. The important thing to understand, the insulation is only for the portion that tra traverses these protected routes. The reason 
When there's a fire, we're getting out. But who's coming in? Our colleagues in the fire service. They're coming in and they're very often taking command and control in the protected routes. And they need to be assured that there's no temperature risk to them while they're trying to fight a fire on our behalf. So all those ducts where you don't use fire lampers and you're using fire duct must be insulated. So just be aware of that one. And the last one, the very last one is smoke control. There are occasions where our smoke evacuation system could be starved of air. There just won't be enough air for the fan to perform. So what we have to do is we have to provide uh, what we call makeup air. So it's important to understand makeup air systems are part of the smoke control system. They need to be fire resisting ducts because they have to stay open in the event of a fire to ensure that there's enough air for the smoke evacuation system to perform. So again, just be careful. Makeup air where it's designed for smoke control must be fire resisting duct, okay? And we hope we won't set your world on fire, okay? I'm just gonna stop sharing at this and I'll hand it over to the host. Michael, you're muted there. Sorry. Yes, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent, and the echo is gone. That was my uh, technology uh, issue. Um, just one very quick question from my, from my own point of view is, um, what degree has uh, rock wool as a general mineral fiber product been tested as an insulation material for wrapping around ductwork? Because you frequently come across it as the kind of like the builder's fallback material. Okay. Any comments um, on that? The only thing I know is, um, You'd have to ask Rockwell about the performance of their own individual product. Where you take a non-fire product, like a thermal insulation, and try to use that in a fire scenario, it's a no-no, just won't work. So you've got to demonstrate that the product has hit uh, EN1363 fire curve, which is up to 1100 degrees and has maintained its temperature for the time in question. Again, if you're putting it on a product, um, you need to talk to Rockwell, but it, it's probably designed for a lot of products but for ductwork, it, it needs to be classified with the ductwork to be certain that the ductwork and the insulation together will perform in the event of a fire. So I'm sorry, I don't have details on, on Rockwell. I know that uh, there's issues with regard to um, fibers in some, I don't want to use Rockwell as a name, but in, in glass, uh, glass wool, you have binders and these binders can burn at 400 degrees. So every product's unique. And I know Rockwell would have overcome that issue but there'll be a lot of older product that people might, like Grenville Tower, misapply. So mm. we don't want to misapply. If you are using something in a fire scenario, get the paperwork and ask the questions because uh, we assume a lot of things. It's not just assume nothing, get the paperwork. And if the paperwork says it's suitable, remember horizontal and vertical. We learned that in Grenville Tower. They tested. Uh, they tested horizontal and installed vertically and it was a completely different scenario. So let's double check our paperwork and don't presume anything. I think as well, the the whole thing of assuming that something is class zero suddenly turned materials into uh, being acceptable to use in a whole load of different scenarios. And it's very important to understand the, the background to the testing um, and, and the configuration of the testing is so, so important. Um, and, and one of the questions that we had there um, is just in relation to maintenance and product shelf life and all of that. What kind of comments can you make in relation to maintenance in terms of, say, what the design intentions were at the beginning of an installation? And then, five, you know, a year later, five years later, um, any comments you want to make in relation to that? Yeah, thank you. There's two things. First of all, our systems are passive. So there's no moving parts in them. So they have a very long life. I mean, they, if they're left alone, they will last. You know, they can last 20 years. The issue is always interference. Now, I have seen um, fan coils connected to kitchen extract. Oh, okay. Okay. I have seen people connecting all sorts of things to smoke ducts where they shouldn't. And the number one problem uh, falls back on us as manufacturers. Very often our products aren't properly labeled. So we make a big deal about a big 
slappy la label that says fire resistant duct. Don't touch it, run away, stay away, because it, there's a tendency when, when something changes four years down the line, and it's nobody's fault because the people who did it aren't there. Somebody comes in, needs to connect to something, and he inadvertently connects to something. So the most important thing is if it's well labeled and somebody connects after that, that's, mm. that's wrong on every front. But if you don't label it, I can see how that can happen. So labeling, and as I say, it's passive. So there are no moving parts. It's not like a fire damper, which needs to be drop tested. It's, it's passive. Right. Um, uh, question there from Dan Fitzgerald is, uh, does, does ventilation ducts from protected area through base and car park require insulation? So, so. Okay, if, if the duct, um, just probably need to clarify the question, is it a um, smoke duct? It would be, it would be. Okay, so, it, yeah. so it's powered. It's Not necessarily powered, it could be, um, it, it could be natural ventilation. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and very often it's, for example, if you've got a, a protected lobby that requires to have a, a 0.4 square meter vent or a duct, then yes. that would be a fire rated duct from the lobby through the car parking area yes. to an external wall opening of some kind. Okay. The way we would look at that is the first thing is we'd identify where the smoke is going to come from. So if it's coming from a lobby across another compartment, it's multi-compartment because it's crossing from one area to another. Okay. So that's, that's an issue. So it's multi-compartment duct. The second thing is, is it driven? So if it's not driven, it's natural. Mm -hmm. Okay. So some people would say that's passive smoke, which is kind of a nonsense term because it's either smoke control or it's not smoke control. So if it's smoke control, is it there to remove smoke in the event of a fire? Um, mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, okay, that's smoke. What temperature is going to be at? We don't have freedom. All we know is we have to test for smoke at up to 1100 degrees. So in theory, you could have 1100 degrees going through that duct. Now, here's the thing. It's not driven. So there's going to be no air being dragged through the system like a normal smoke evacuation. So you need the fire engineer to make an, a, a determination on that. Mm -hmm. um, there's, we call it, we, we have this issue in the industry about passive ducts. So I, I was trying to avoid it, but it's there. It's just, we can't. And there are two views. Now, neither of these views are wrong. Okay, so there are two views. So people will come down one side or the other. The view is this, and this is the one that I would have had years ago, was passive duct going through areas in event of a fire doesn't generate any air. There's no air movement. And secondly, even if there is air movement, the fans are ki killed in the event of a fire. So there's no flow through of air. In that scenario, how are you going to generate flashover temperatures? The answer is you're not. So don't need to insulate. That's an old view. However, I was well educated when I went to London. And what they said to me was, that's a lovely idea, Mike. I really like that one. That's wonderful. But how about this scenario? Your duct is an E-rated duct. You're offering me E120. But my wall is EI120. You're crossing an EI-rated zone with an E product. And I said, oh, good point. So mm -hmm. some people will say passive ducts need to be insulated to maintain the EI criteria of the zone itself it's crossing. Okay, okay. And I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Everybody needs to talk about it. Even if it's not compartmentation, it still might have an insulation value, like a protected, a protected lobby wall might just be a 30 minute wall. So therefore it, it, it won't typically be a compartment wall, but it still has an insulation obligation. Oh no, let, let me clarify. You can have walls within your compartment. And when you go through walls within a fire compartment, it doesn't make a difference. They're irrelevant. It's only when you cross a fire compartment wall that okay. it becomes multi and that issue arises. Yes, yes. Sorry, I didn't clear, clarify that. No, that's very clear. Yeah, that's very clear. Thanks. Barry, do you want to... Um... So um, another question here, just uh, what about supports on fire rated ductwork? Do these need to be increased? Okay, a uh, very good question. There is a specific formula for the bracketry involved in, in, um, in fire resisting duct. 
and so many newtons per square meter or whatever. So there is a way of milligram, whatever it is, there's a way of calculating that. That's in all the documentation. And um, what I do know is uh, if you approach or like a manufacturer says, we will provide you with the details of the brackets that we used in our tests. In the classification port, it'll determine the maximum spacing between hangers. So depending on the, if it's EI 60, you'll get away with 1500. If it's 90, it drops down to 1200. It can even go down to 800 on the bigger stuff. So your brackets can be closer. That has a huge impact. You might need M10 rod, it might increase to M16. Mm. So mm. again, this is all mathematically calculated. Very important to ask the provider of the product to give you some sort of details on that. Yes, the answer is yes, for all intents and purposes. The weight, there is a, 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 there is a weight associated with the product naturally whenever it's not in a fire. But in a fire scenario, all uh, metals, like for example, treaded rod that extend beyond 1.5 meters will elongate in a fire. Mm. So for example, in the mm. installation guide, when, you're, when your treaded rod exceeds 1.5 meters, you need to put a fire coating on it. So an intermescent paint. And so we have a specific one that we use, SC801, I think it is, and we put it on the rods. Brilliant, it absolutely works. We've used it in tests. So in a fire, the rods will elongate, the brackets have to be plain channel, slotted channel will sag. So this is the experience that we've had. I can't speak about other manufacturers of their products, what experience they had. I mean, some of them are using slotted and if it worked for them, fine. I just know what it worked for me. So the classification report will reference that the bracketry is part of the system. So again, we take a lot of care to either increase the number of brackets or to increase the strength to reflect in a fire scenario. When it's in a fire, everything's different. And um, any comments just in relation to distortion of the ductwork itself in, in fire testing? They yeah. say, for instance, differences between a 60 minute fire test and a 120 or a 90 minute fire test and a 120 minute fire test. Yeah. Okay. And um, with regard to the ductwork, um, the ductwork is tested for cross-sectional area in an EN13668 test. So it must maintain for smoke purposes, must maintain 90% cross-sectional area. So that's measured in an EN13668 test. So we construct the duct for smoke based on EN13668. Under BS476, the cross-sectional area was 75% you had to maintain. Under EN, it's 90. And that is, that is very significant. So when you put in an EN smoke duct, it is a better duct than a BS476 duct. I can tell you that that's a fact. And based on recent tests we did with BS476, I can tell you EN is, your, is the way to go because of its strength. And because it will maintain its it will maintain its performance when it's critical, when it's really needed. I think there's similar reactions in relation to the fire door testing as well. Uh, that the uh, the period of fire resistance under the EN, EN testing is delivering more robust doors, um, particularly they when it comes to compartmentation and issues to do with that. Yeah, they tend to be denser and heavier, mm. and that's just yeah. what you need. Um, it's about re res restricting that energy and not allowing it to pass. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. so, sorry, um, Michael, just a couple yes, of questions sorry. that po I popped in on the chat there as well. Um, just the first one there was in relation to um, Michael, just, just looking for examples of, of scenarios where we have um, in to out and out to in ductworks, just I suppose scenario, just examples of installations where that's okay. present. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, so what we're talking about there is type A and type B. So your A, the way we remember it is A is all around. So that's a fire on the outside of the duct and we don't want it to get into the duct. Kitchen is typical. So you'd have a kitchen duct and you don't want the fire getting inside the duct. So that's something that you're sealing it or preventing the fire from entering. Um, across, uh, what would you say, fire duct going across a, a corridor. If the corridor goes on fire, you don't want the fire getting into the fire duct and entering into the apartments or whatever you have on either side. So that's an A scenario. So what we're testing in the A test is we're testing to make sure fire doesn't penetrate. The second type, which is your type B, is your fire, we call it fire between, right? So the fire is inside the duct. That is your typical smoke evacuation system because you're exhausting the hot gases inside the duct through the building. So that's, that's how we refer to it. So A is your kitchen, B is your smoking 
the easy way to remember. Yeah. There's a couple of, uh, of other ones that come in there as well, Michael. Uh, they just they, they had popped up on the on the chat as opposed to the Q and A. Um, in, in relation to the rods and the Unistrut, um, just to clarify on on the supply of that. Uh, as to whether it needs to, be, whether it could be, it could be sourced separately to the, to the correct spec, or whether it needs to come as a, as a whole system assembly. Okay. That's that's a very good observation. We historically have not uh, insisted on using a specific one. Um, so the, the for example, the channel will always be forty one by forty one by two point five, basic, and then it goes eighty by forty, and then we go up to seventy six and all the rest of different sizes. So we would tell you the gauge. On the rod, there is a DIN standard, specific standard, and in our installation manual, I can't remember it off the top of my head, there is a specific number. And there is cheap rod out there. Now, if you buy the cheap rod, that's, that's just not gonna work. So you have to have the right DIN standard. It is part and parcel of a third party certifier installer ensuring that he has the right materials for installation. So when you insist on on the person being third party certified, like Ferris, what you're doing is you're saying, somebody's gonna audit him. And when they come to audit, they have a list of the materials and they want to check what stores are you using to make sure they're using the right thing. There's always the danger, out of sight, out of mind, anything can happen. But we are very specific in the install manual. This is the type that you must use. And we leave sourcing the brackets up to others. Can I just say there are new products coming down the line and these new products are significant improvements in what we have. When they do come, we're using a very specific support because the support is lighter and stronger. So we, when that does happen, it will be a full system, which does give people comfort. And I can see the value of it, but at this point in time, we're not just there yet. Um, There's one other point there to clarify, just, um, and it was, it was one I had asked answered in the Q&A there. Um, but uh, in relation to BS double five double eight, um, so obviously that that's something that's been withdrawn and replaced by um, BS double nine double nine. But but obviously it's something that I think anyone, if, if you're familiar with 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 uh, technical guides that would be, it's it's heavily referenced and that's still here in Ireland. So it's still a recognised standard, even even though it's officially been been withdrawn by BSI in the UK. Okay. Look, um, I think we've exhausted the questions for now. And I would just like on behalf of the Fire and Safety Division the Committee to thank Michael for the uh, fantastic content and the, uh, the breadth of uh, issues that you've covered and the clarity, which I think is, is great to receive from somebody who knows what he's talking about um, and to, um, to clear up a number of doubts and questions and uh, to, to, uh, to really uh, challenge us to uh, read up the documentation that's going to be made available from Lindav uh, subsequent to, uh, to this presentation. And just to thank Barry as well for uh, organizing this with the committee and uh, to wish yourselves the best of um, every kind of luck going forward. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And look, we're always available to assist you with questions. So you got something weird and wonderful. We won't always have the answer, but we'll steer you in the right direction if nothing else. So we're here to help, help and make sure that everybody's job's done right. Thank you so much. And Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks yeah, so much for having us. Thanks very much. Okay. Cheerio.